The Radeon RX 6600 is by definition a pretty boring GPU. There are no new record set, no ridiculous VRAM capacity or knocked off ends. But that is simply the nature of a mainstream GPU, which this finally actually is. It's been almost a full year since the announcement of the big Navi RDNA 2 cards, and now we finally have small Navi for the masses. So, the question for the bench today is, is the 6600 good? Yeah. For testing today, we have the ASUS dual version of the 6600, the MSI Mac 2X OC for the 6600 XT, and the Ventus 2X OC for the 3060 and 3060 Ti. All of these cards require a single 8-pin power connector, and the display outputs are also the same 3 display ports and 1 HDMI port. Physically, the 6600 Duo measures 243mm long, 134mm tall, and 49mm thick, which is 2.5 slots, so slightly on the larger side for low-end cards, but still not that bad. The power connector is recessed in by about 10mm, so that helps fit it in smaller MATX cases like our Ghost. To benchmark these GPUs, we are using our usual 5800X X570 test bench with 32GB of 3600MHz memory. Smart access memory or resizable bar is supported, but has not been enabled for today's testing. Starting with some eSports titles, we have Apex Legends. For Apex, we test in the firing range as it is the most reliably reproducible. The performance numbers here will be roughly what you will see when playing an actual game, except in intense firefights with a lot of Legends abilities flying everywhere. In those situations, expect FPS to drop by 30 or so, so just keep that in mind. With maxed out settings at 1080p, the 6600 achieves an average of 151 FPS, with a 121 FPS 1% low. Some settings tweaks will be required to get the game running at well above 120 FPS, but it's not too far off. At 1440p, the average frame rate drops to 106 FPS, which is pretty difficult to get reliably above 90 FPS. So to bridge that gap to a smooth 1440p 144Hz experience, you should shell out some extra cash for a 6600 XT or 3060. In this game, the 6600 is about 15% behind the 6600 XT at both 1080p and 1440p. Since the 3060 is still Nvidia's lowest end Ampere card, that is still the best comparison for the 6600, even though the price points are quite different. Compared to the 3060, the 6600 is 10% behind at 1080p and 16% behind at 1440p. Next, we have Rainbow Six Siege. With ultra settings at 1080p, the 6600 averages 256 FPS and is a small setting tweak away from stable 240Hz experience. At 1440p, the card gets an average of 155 FPS with a minimum of 129 FPS. This again is just a small tweak away from a stable 1440p 144Hz experience, which is pretty great for a budget card of this price point. When compared to the 6600 XT, the 6600 is 11% behind, roughly what is expected given the 12.5 reduction in core count. So, you can expect 1080p 240Hz or 1440p 144Hz performance from the 6600 in older or simpler esports titles. We use Rainbow Six Siege as a benchmark, but this applies to games like Valorant, CSGO, Dota 2 or League as well. But if you're playing newer and more demanding esports games like Apex or Warzone, you can only expect a good 1080p 144Hz experience. Okay, so how is performance in open world or AAA games? We have some pretty interesting results from the brand new Far Cry 6 at the end, so keep watching for that. But to start us off, we have Horizon Zero Dawn. At 1080p, the 3060 and 6600 XT are on par, while the 6600 is 15% behind and the 3060 Ti is 20% ahead. At 1440p, the 6600 gets a playable 65 FPS, or 11% behind the 6600 XT. To give us some ray tracing data, we have Cyberpunk 2077. Unsurprisingly, the Radeon GPUs get abysmal results even at 1080p. Even 3060 and 3060 Ti average well below 60 FPS, but the Ampere GPUs can utilize DLSS for a sizable FPS boost. But personally, with how good the lighting already looks without ray tracing, turning on RTX in this game isn't particularly worth it, no matter what GPU you are using. And finally, we have the beautifully strange results that is Far Cry 6. Testing was conducted at ultra settings with the optional HD texture pack installed, which straight up doubles the install size of the game. At 1080p with the ultra preset, the 6600 offers an average of 88 FPS, pretty good for a new AAA game. It's a similar story at 1440p. The 6600 averaged 59 FPS, not great, but this game does have FSR, which we will test after we talk about the significantly lower minimum frame rate the two AMD GPUs have. We think this is an issue with the benchmark, as this low frame rate is only observed at the end of the benchmark, as the screen slowly fades to black. 
Playing through the initial part of the game also shows a relatively stable frame rate from both the NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Alright, now on to FSR. Tag Power Up has some pretty good image quality comparisons, so we're not going to get into that here. Our performance results though are a little strange, so let's go through this step by step. At 1440p, the NVIDIA GPUs post a 15 and 20% improvement for the 3060 Ti and 3060 respectively. For the 6600 though, we see a massive 49% increase in FPS, bringing it to 88 FPS. The 6600 was previously 17% behind the 3060 without FSR, but it's not actually ahead by a small margin. Here's where it gets properly strange. The 6600 XT also lands at the same average of 88 FPS. We see similar results at 1440p, except this time the improvements for the 3060 Ti, 3060 and 6600 XT are at most 5%, while the 6600 gets a 12% improvement. There is most certainly some strange bottleneck here that's limiting these GPUs to roughly 90 or 100 FPS. If you would like to see more detailed testing of this, leave a comment below to let us know you are actually interested in this game. Now that you have seen the results, what do you think of the 6600? From our perspective, the 6600 is the cheapest current gen GPU from either AMD or Nvidia. And that makes it basically an instant win until Nvidia comes out with a 3050 Ti for desktop. So what about prices? The official AMD or Nvidia MSRP might make the 6600 and 6600 XC look like a terrible deal compared to the 3060 or 3060 Ti. But when comparing the real prices you can actually buy a GPU at, the 6600 XTs have been cheaper than 3060s, and we expect the 6600 to be another tier cheaper than the 6600 XT. This makes the 6600 the most compelling option for mainstream gamers. Now that we have the key parts of the video out of the way, let's get a little bit more nerdy with this. How is it that the Radeon GPUs are seemingly immune to demand from miners? While the NVIDIA GPUs have the LHR mining limiter, it only targets the Ethereum mining algorithm, which leaves the door open for miners to mine on a different coin that isn't limited. Miners are also actively trying to bypass or crack the artificial LHR limiter, and concerningly, there has been some real progress on that front. The AMD cards, on the other hand, have an inherently lower mining rate due to AMD's use of a smaller VRAM bandwidth. The 6600 XT has a memory bandwidth of just 256GB per second. For comparison, the 3060 has 40% more bandwidth and the 3060 Ti has a whopping 75% more bandwidth. For mining, this is essentially an LHR that's just inherent to the system, no getting around it. For gaming, AMD makes up for this reduced VRAM bandwidth with the use of Infinity Cache, that is just more cache on the die itself so that the GPU would need to access VRAM less often. RDNA 2 has been out for a year now, and so far Infinity Cache has been working flawlessly. While we're talking about bandwidth and Infinity Cache, let's pull up the full specs table. The 6600 features the Navi 23 chip, same as in the 6600 XT, just with 4 compute units disabled. This gives the 6600 12.5% less cost than the 6600 XT. For clock speeds, the 6600 has a 100MHz lower max boost clock, and a 300MHz reduction in the expected game clock. Together with the lower clock speeds, the power limit is also lower, at just 100 watts for the chip and memory and 132 watts for the whole card. This is an impressively low power consumption for a card of this caliber, and it's great news for those into ultra small phone factor systems. If you do want to turn up the power though, this power limit can be adjusted to a max of plus 20%, pretty great for a budget card. The 3060 from comparison can only be adjusted by plus 6% on some cards and a max of plus 12% on even the most expensive cards. The memory clock speed can also be increased by about 9% and the memory timings can be switched to the fast preset. However, in my limited testing with the pre-release drivers, the memory adjustments were not stable at all. For the memory subsystem, the 6600 uses mostly the same configuration as the 6600 XT, with 32MB of Infinity Cache and 8GB of GDDR6 over a 128-bit bus. The clock speed has been reduced to 14 gigabits per second though, for an overall VRAM bandwidth of 224 gigabytes per second. So that is it for a review of the 6600. Do you think there is anything we missed? Put your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for future videos. Intel's 12th gen Alder Lake CPUs are launching really soon and they're shaping up to be pretty interesting with the big and small cores and DDR5. We'll have lots of content about that, so we'll see you in the next one.